What's up, what's up? Welcome back to Air to Air Jordan. I'm Edward, and I am back with another episode of my podcast where we talk about the top 10 most iconic NBA players of the 21st century. So far, we've talked about the big ticket Kevin Garnett, Steve Nash, Dikembe Mutombo, and Kevin Durant. And now we're here for episode five to talk about player number six on our list. Last episode, I mentioned that this is a special episode, and that's because we're actually going to be talking about two players who were tightly linked, not just throughout their careers, but also by blood. These two are cousins and played on 12 different teams. One of them was in the league for 22 seasons, which is an NBA record. As you probably guessed, I'm talking about Vince Carter and Tracy McGrady. Before we dive into it, allow me to reintroduce myself. I'm Edward, and I grew up playing basketball. I played, I coached, and I loved watching the NBA. So I'm excited to bring you this podcast. Without further ado, let's jump in. BC and T-Mac are second cousins, and one thing I gathered from my research for this podcast is that they also have the same middle name which is Lamar. That was a crazy thing that I learned. The story of how they found out their grandmas were sisters is actually kind of funny. And they talked about it on Vince Carter's podcast. They're both from Florida. Um, and they crossed paths a few times, played together in AAU ball. They met up at Chapel Hill for some pickup games in the summer of 97, which is the year T-Mac was drafted. And one day that week, T-Mac told Vince Carter he wouldn't be there to play ball because he had a reunion to go to. And Vince Carter said he had summer school that day. But then, on that day, Vince Carter received a phone call from his grandma. But lo and behold, on the other side of the line, it was actually T-Mac telling Vince Carter he found out their second cousins. I think technically second cousins once removed. But correct me if I'm wrong on that. T-Mac was drafted ninth in 1997 by Toronto after skipping college, and Vince Carter was drafted with the fifth pick a year later after spending three years at North Carolina. Uh, Vince Carter actually was drafted by the Warriors and instantly traded to the Raptors for Anton Jameson. And that wasn't the only draft Vince Carter was involved in that was lopsided. Um, Obviously, in this case, it benefited the Raptors. Jameson was good, but he wasn't on Vince Carter's level. And back to McGrady, due to his height at 6'8 and his athleticism, he was compared to players like Scottie Pippen and the Iceman George Gervin. Vince Carter, on the other hand, he was said to be an extremely dangerous and versatile scorer, according to Draft Express, but he was said to not put in much effort on the defensive end. What we saw throughout his career, though, is he, his number one attribute was probably just his athleticism. And in connection to that, his longevity in the NBA as well. Um, and it's known, obviously, that the duo did not have much playoff success in their careers. Carter made the postseason 11 times, but never got past the conference finals, which he reached in 2010 with the Magic. And T-Mac is known as one of the most cursed playoff performers of all time. He made it nine times, yet only got past the first round once. Technically twice, I guess you could say, but he was injured one of the years. We'll see what I'm talking about later. But the time that he did get passed and he actually got minutes was when he made the finals in 2013 with the Spurs. But he only played six games during that run and averaged only five minutes and 12 seconds per game throughout those appearances. And in those six games, he also scored a grand total of zero points. So, yeah, when he was in his prime, not much success. Not to mention his curse may have been the reason for the Heat's miracle comeback in Game 6, and of course the Ray Allen 3. So, But the lack of playoff success did not stop Vince Carter and Tracy McGrady from being iconic. So I put them on this list because of how they carved their own path to iconicism, despite the lack of success. It's not just the playoffs that make players iconic. You know, as we've gone through this list, you could probably tell that most of the players... We go from players with less, least cha- less championships to those with more championships, and we've been increasing, but until now because of how iconic this duo was. And so everything started when they teamed up on the Raptors. Toronto drafted T-Mac in 1997 and picked up Vince Carter in 1998, logging in two athletic wings and dynamic scores. Carter averaged 18 as a rookie and one rookie of the year, but his points per game average climbed to 25 the following year and stayed in the 20s the rest of his tenure in Toronto. T-Mac got much less playing time and only averaged 15.4 at most, while he was in Toronto. They both did a little bit of everything, but it was their scoring that made them scary for the league. They only made the playoffs together once in 2000 and got swept by the Knicks in the first round. The success they could have had if they stayed together in their prime will never be known. But Carter quickly became a fan favorite because of his dunks, such as his fast break 360 against the Cavs. In 2000, Carter, of course, won the dunk contest, which we'll go into detail about later. But that victory and just his monster dunks that year or what started the insanity era in the NBA. This era with Vince Carter in his early 20s, as athletic as he ever was, is 
really one of the things that cemented him as one of the most iconic players of the 21st century. He and T-Mac played together for two seasons in Toronto until McGrady signed with the Magic at the turn of the millennium. T-Mac said he loved Toronto because he didn't get as much playing time as he felt he deserved. But later he did say that he should have stayed because he thinks they could have contended. And maybe they could have. They, of course, drafted Chris Bosh in the 2003 draft. I don't know if they would have had as high a pick if McGrady stayed on the team, but can you imagine that big three together? They definitely could have done amazing things, but we'll never know. Instead, T-Mac and Vince Carter never really had the playoff success, and Chris Bosh won a couple of championships with a different big three. So, And we'll talk about that big three later because uh, one of the players from that big three will be on this list. You could probably guess who. But anyways, Vince Carter, in his first year without his cousin, he led the Raptors to their first ever playoff series because, remember, the Raptors were established in the 90s. Uh, it was them and the Vancouver Grizzlies, the two Canadian teams. Now, of course, the Grizzlies are in Memphis. And with averages of 27.3 points, 6.5 rebounds, and almost two blocks and two steals, Vince Carter led the Raptors past the Knicks three games to two. First round was five games at that point. In the second round against Philadelphia, the Raptors forced game seven before going down. Carter recorded a playoff high 50 points in game three to give the Raptors the 2-1 lead before they ultimately lost that series. Another fun thing about Vince Carter is that he continued his studies at North Carolina and he actually attended his graduation ceremony in May 2001, which is the morning of Game 7 against the Sixers. That's pretty much unheard of. Uh, that was not uh, in my segment, uh, but if uh, Vince Carter managed to lead the Raptors to victory in that game, maybe it would have been. But they lost, did not make the conference finals, and so it did not make my segment, even though it is a really good story either way. And after that season, Vince Carter's points per game average continued to stay in the 20s, but that was his only playoff series one with the Raptors. He's been pretty healthy throughout his career overall, but he did suffer a knee ending, a season-ending knee injury in 2002. Vince Carter stayed with the Raptors until 2004 when he requested a trade because he was frustrated with management. So T-Mac and Vince Carter both had a couple frustrations there in Toronto. The story of the trade that happened, though, was actually nuts. The Raptors sent him to the Nets for Alonzo Mourning, who never played a game for the Raptors because he didn't meet the team's medical conditions. Eric and Aaron Williams, who didn't contribute much, and two picks, one of whom was a bust. They traded the other pick along with Jalen Rose for Antonio Davis, who was waived eight games into a stint with the Raptors. It was a crazy trade that, uh, uh, it, it was a lopsided trade that the Nets actually won, which was kind of a surprise. But that's not even the crazy part. Now let's take a quick break for my segment, the Airs Top 3, and let's take a look at Vince Carter and Tracy McGrady's Top 3 Career Moments. There's a few moments that didn't make the cut, such as Vince Carter's 50-point performance against the Sixers in the second round of the 2001 playoffs, and T-Mac and Vince Carter's many poster dunks, which of course they both had, as well as T-Mac's buzzer beater against the Mavs in the playoffs. But for the first moment that did make it, number three, Vince Carter's buzzer beater when he returned to Toronto as part of the Nets. His revenge was really incredible, and that wasn't even his first return to Toronto. The first time he came back, Carter dropped 39 to lead New Jersey to a victory, after being down 14 at the half. The return the following season was even better. The game was close at the end, but Calderon missed a free throw with seven seconds left to keep it a two-point Toronto lead. Jason Kidd grabbed the rebound, passed it ahead to Carter, who hit the game-winning three, leaving a tenth of a second on the clock. The reason this was more special was because Carter himself called it the best shot of his career. Carter had 42 points and 10 rebounds in 45 minutes that game. He was kind of known for going off any time he returned up north. Now, going back in time, number two is Vince Carter's slam dunk contest win in 2000. He was known for his athletic in-game dunks, as well as his dunk contest performance. And now in, in 2000, he obviously won, and he threw down a signature arm in the rim dunk. In the dunk contest, he made a lot of awesome dunks. It wasn't just that one. He had a couple 360 windmills uh, between the legs dunk off a bounce pass from T-Mac, who, by the way, was also in that dunk contest, and, of course, a signature elbow dunk. He got 350s, a 49, and a 48 which is, was just incredible, and that's what won him the title. That performance by Vince Carter is what ushered in Vince Sanity, like we said earlier. Um, and, you know, the dunk contest now wasn't the same as it used to be, but if we could get that type of dunk contest again, that could really revitalize it. If we could get somebody to do these crazy dunks like Vince Carter did, that's what we need right now because it hasn't been the same. You know, the last player I could think of who really went off like that was Aaron Gordon, and he was snubbed a couple times. But his dunks were just incredible. But back to the topic at hand, number one is going to be a T-Mac moment. And I think you all probably know what moment it's going to be. 
So this moment happened in 2005 when he scored 13 points in 33 seconds to help the Rockets come back to beat the Spurs. He kind of turned into Michael Jordan in that moment, which is funny because he was compared to Scottie Pippen before the draft. And that's not the final comparison we'll have of him to Michael Jordan. By the way, stay tuned. Stick around. All the Houston fans had already started leaving the arena that game because the Rockets were down by eight with less than 40 seconds to go. But then T-Mac buried a three. Then the Rockets fouled, got the ball back, and he buried another three, plus the foul. Then he hit another contested three after the Spurs made two more free throws. And with eight seconds left, he came away with a steal, raced down the court, and hit another three to put the Rockets ahead. That moment was legendary. The way he just hit four straight contested threes in the clutch like that. The only other similar performance I could think of is Reggie Miller's eight points in nine seconds. For someone who had as much misfortune in the playoffs as T-Mac, he was more clutch than you'd expect. That right there was legendary, and I don't know if it'll ever be replicated. Even Stephen Curry hasn't done something that crazy. Those were my top three moments from the careers of Vince Carter and Tracy McGrady. Let's get back to talking about their journeys in the NBA. Now, the crazy part of the Vince Carter trade in 2004 wasn't even the fact that the Raptors got nothing in return for him. It was that former Raptors general manager, Glenn Grunwald, rejected a trade offer of Vince Carter and Antonio Davis, who was in his first stint with the Raptors, for Steve Nash and Dirk Nowitzki. You got that right, a two-time MVP in Steve Nash and an NBA champion who led his team through Kobe, KD, and LeBron to win the title. That was Dirk, of course. They could have had a big three of Nash, Nowitzki, and Bosch if they still drafted him in 03. Actually, no, the trade was in 2004, so they did already get him, along with Jalen Rose. But that would have been an incredible team, but they said no, and the rest is kind of history. So Toronto missed a huge opportunity, while Vince Carter thrived in New Jersey alongside Jason Kidd, and T-Mac put up career highs with the Magic. So back to Tracy McGrady, because we've been talking a lot about Vince Carter. Even though T-Mac's points per game total went as high as 32.1 points per game in 03, he never won the MVP. He finished fourth in voting behind Kobe, KG, and Tim Duncan that year. And Tim Duncan was the one who won that award. He also never really let him on any playoff runs. Like we said, he was kind of cursed when it all came to be. T-Mac joined the Magic at what was probably the worst possible time as far as championship aspirations. Because mid-90s, they had Penny and Shaq made the finals and lost to Houston. In 2009, with Dwight Howard, they made the finals and lost to the Lakers. T-Mac was there smack dab between those two eras. Um, And so it just was kind of unfortunate for him. Uh, but more on uh, more on the 2009 team later because um, one of the two players we're talking about actually joined them after 2009. We'll see who. But back to T-Mac, he left for the Rockets in 2004, which was around the same time Vince Carter was traded to the Nets. But to avoid jumping around, we'll stay with T-Mac for a bit. So in his first season with Houston, that's when the miracle happened. 13 points in 33 seconds. The Rockets looked really good with him on the team, and then a couple seasons later, Yao Ming started turning into an all-star. So it it looked like they would finally get something going, but unfortunately for them, the curse was real. McGrady averaged upwards of 20 for almost all the season with the Rockets, but he also dealt with some injuries. The Rockets made the playoffs every year he was on the team, except for 2006, when he had frequent back spasms, causing him to miss lots of games. In 2005 and 2007, they lost in seven in the first round of the playoffs, which again is where that curse comes in. And in 2008, they lost in six. They finally won a series in 2009, but lost in seven in the second round. But T-Mac had season-ending surgery on his left shoulder and knee that year and didn't play in the playoffs. That's what we were talking about earlier, how T-Mac did win another series. His team did, but he wasn't playing. But lucky for him, Yao Ming was almost able to lead the Rockets to the conference finals by himself, losing in game seven to the Lakers. For T-Mac, his frequent injuries caused him to regress every year, little by little, since he averaged 32 in 2003. And by the time his stint with the Rockets was over, he was out of his prime. He averaged only 15.6 in his shortened 2009 season. And the following year, McGrady was traded to the Knicks at the deadline. But he was already past his prime. Over the next three seasons, he moved from the Knicks to the Pistons to the Hawks and never averaged double digits again. Funnily enough, he started and ended his career with the same team as Vince Carter. But of course, T-Mac finished his career eight seasons earlier. And now back to Vince Carter. He played for the Nets from 05 to 09. His timeline was kind of similar to T-Mac. While T-Mac was over there in Houston, Vince Carter was in New Jersey. That was before they moved to Brooklyn, of course. So if I ever say Brooklyn, I apologize for mis- misspeaking. And Vince Carter led them to the playoffs the first three years, but never passed the second round. He averaged as high as 27.5 points per game, and he was exactly the type of player they were looking to pair, pair alongside Jason Kidd. 
And Kidd was exactly the playmaker Vince Carter needed. So it seemed like a match made almost in heaven. Kidd was there through the 2008 season, and Carter left a year later. After a stint with the Nets, Carter had a history of joining teams right after they made their deepest run in the playoffs. The Magic picked him up in 2010, right after making the NBA Finals. Then they traded him to the Suns the following season, and that was right after the Suns made the conference finals. And from 2012 to 2014, he played for the Mavs, joining them, of course, the year after they won the championship. Carter dipped below 20 points per game when he left New Jersey and dipped below double digits after his final season in Dallas. Now, for Dallas, the reason they couldn't go back-to-back with Vince Carter, at least part of the reason, is, of course, they lost Tyson Chandler. And for the Magic, he made the conference finals with the Magic, who were hoping to be he would be the perimeter creator they were lacking the year before. See, if T-Mac was on the team still, then uh, I, it would have been a way closer series against the Lakers because, of course, it only went to five. I don't know who would have won, but they didn't have T-Mac. And Vince Carter joined the season too late. But the Magic lost to the Celtics in 2010. He missed the playoffs with the Suns and lost in the first round with the Mavs in 2012. And the Mavs, of course, lost Tyson Chandler after the championship. He was a huge reason for their success the year prior. He was exactly that dominant force they needed down low. And I guess the addition of a Vince Carter, who was a bit past his prime, wasn't enough to get them back to the promised land. But after that, he dedicated the rest of his career to being a mentor for young players. He played for the Grizzlies, Kings, and of course the Hawks before calling it quits in 2020. He played in the NBA for 22 years, which, as he mentioned earlier, is a record. Now, for the accolades of the two players, Carter amassed 25,728 points throughout his career, which put him at the time 19th on the all-time scoring list, but now he's 21st. We'll see if Westbrook passes him. He's the only active player who's close. His career high is 51 in the game, which he scored on two occasions. He's an eight-time All-Star and has made the second and third team, never the first team, though. He was also named the Twyman Stokes Teammate of the Year in 2016 and won the NBA Sportsmanship in 2020. The NBA Sportsmanship Award, I should say. And he won the Olympic gold, averaging 14.8 in 2000. That year was the year of dunks for him. Of course, that 2000, which is when he won the dunk contest. And in the Olympics, he posterized 7-2 French center Frederick Weiss. The French media dubbed that the dunk of death. Now, T-Mac, his accolades, he has made seven All-NBA teams, two of them first teams. He also led the NBA in scoring in 03 and 04 and was named most improved player when he joined the Magic in 2001. He is also a seven-time All-Star. T-Mac's career high is 62, which he scored as part of the Magic, and that remains their franchise record. But maybe Paolo Bancaro is going to pass it. Who knows? T-Mac was compared more to Scottie Pippen coming out of his draft, but one thing that makes him more like Michael Jordan, as we mentioned earlier, is that he actually tried to play baseball for a bit after retirement. He's not in the MLB, though. He joined the Atlantic League of Professional Baseball as a pitcher, started in the All-Star game in 2014, and called it quits immediately after that game. Now, as you know, I like to talk a bit about something cool each of the players on this list does off of the court. And in 2007, while T-Mac was still in the league, he traveled to Chad, a country in Africa, along with members of the Enough Project, whose objective is to end crimes against humanity. McGrady went to refugee camps in Darfur, which was in the middle of a civil war, in an effort to help kids there connect with children and schools from the U.S. He recruited other NBA players to join him as well. A documentary called Three Points was made about his humanitarian efforts. So shout out to T-Mac for that. Vince Carter has done his fair share of advocacy as well, such as when he showed up for the Duquesne University men's basketball team after five of their players were shot in 2006. He has donated to many causes, and all the way back in 1998, he started the Embassy of Hope Foundation to help children and their families. Of note is that Vince Carter has also acted in quite a few shows and movies, such as Like Mike. He was also a basketball analyst for ESPN from 2020 to 2023 after which he joined Yes Network as an analyst for the Brooklyn Nets. Also, he and his mom opened a restaurant in Daytona Beach in 2010. It was open until they sold it in 2017. And now I'm going to end this episode by saying that Vince Carter is the only NBA player in history to play in four different decades. Let that sink in. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the podcast. For a quick recap, Tracy McGrady was one of the most prolific scorers of the modern NBA, and Vince Carter was one of the most athletic wings the league has ever seen. While they didn't have that much playoff success, their many accolades and their awe-inspiring play made them almost as iconic as some of the players we've seen on this list with multiple championships. That'll do it for this episode of Air to Air Jordan. If you made it this far, thank you for listening. Check out my website, airtoairjordan.podbean, that's P-O-D-B-E-A-N.com. 
for more information about me and my podcast. I'm going to be taking a bit of a hiatus while I focus on work before I return for part two of the series. So I'm deciding to kind of split it into two parts. And that's going to start, of course, with episode six. The next player on our list has four championships in eight seasons. And I'm giving you a big clue because I'm excited for when I come back to give you that next episode. Thanks again for listening. Make sure to subscribe and keep an eye out for the next episode. See you next time. Peace.